Hi, thank you for joining me today on Campfire Chats with Honorable Outfitters. I am Mr. Dyer, your single host today. So if you are new to my podcast, this podcast is specifically about camping and outdoor adventure. And uh, it's something that's close and near and dear to my heart. And today we're going to dive into a topic that is very personal to me, and that is youth in the outdoors. Now, if you don't have a kid, or maybe you're not a kid, that you're listening to a podcast, but, you know, this hobby that we have, it's something that's so special to us, we all love outdoor adventure, whatever it is, maybe it's camping, maybe it's hiking, maybe it's fishing or hunting, backpacking, you know, like there's so many different options out there for outdoor adventure. The, the catch of it is, though, if we don't pass it on to the next generation, then what's going to happen to it? And maybe that's not a, a big deal to you, or maybe that's not something that's in the back of your mind right now, especially if you don't have kids, or maybe you don't want to have kids. But there is a tremendous amount of value that one gets from teaching others. So maybe, maybe you're not even someone who wants to teach kids. Now, I'm a teacher. I have got uh, many years teaching. At this point, I even have many years of being a scout master, so I'm very active in uh, volunteering my knowledge, my time for outdoor recreation. So I'm a little biased, and I'm willing to admit that I'm a little biased. And I'm even willing to admit that I'm a little biased. But the truth is, if young people or people who are going to have or impact young people don't get involved, then you know, we, we run into a lot of different problems. If you want the future of maybe our park system, if you want the future of good hunting grounds, if you want the future of uh, good backpacking trails, eventually we're all going to have to give it up. And if we don't do something about it, if we're not stewards, and I'm not talking about making sure that our campfires are nice and tidy and making sure that we leave no trace, you know, oh, I'm talking about if we don't set up for our future, then all those things that we love and enjoy, it's going to fade out. It is, because people aren't going to care. The next generation isn't going to care. And as a teacher, I can tell you that apathy is strong in younger generations. I've taught high school and I've taught middle school. I stay away from the elementary grades and you know they're still growing as people. But apathy is a epidemic, I would say, when it comes to just in general. Just in general, apathy is, uh, is an epidemic. But the thing of it is, is it can be fixed. And the best way to fix apathy is to expose people to the benefits of whatever it is they're apathetic about. So that means we need brave men and women, people who are responsible, people who are qualified or maybe wanting to be qualified to try to make an impact on the next generation. And, and that's what we're getting into, because that's the problem that we are tackling in this particular episode. How do we solve this issue of apathy? How do we solve this issue of making sure what we leave behind is in a good pair of hands? So, starting off, I thought we would take a page from uh, history. Take a page from history. In the early 20th century, when the car and auto camping craze really started. That just so happened to line up really well with an explosion of young people's organizations like the YMCA, the WMCA, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Campfire Guides. You know, like There's a huge explosion in civic organizations. And so all these fraternal and civic organizations and youth organizations, they work together really well because of the car and auto craze. It gave people the opportunity to go beyond the 30, 50 mile radius that they've been stuck in their whole lives because the car gave them the freedom. 
how does this tie in with young people? Well, I, I specialize in reenacting and living history as a scoutmaster. And I've got a lot of research about the Boy Scouts in particular and how it exploded and what it did in the early 20th century. And back in the early 20th century, a person was specifically selected to lead a troop. Oftentimes, it wasn't even a parent of the scout. Oftentimes, it was a member of a church or of a civic organization or a fraternal organization that was approached and says, hey, this is something we're wanting to do for our community. We want to start a, a Girl Scout program or a Boy Scout program or a Camp Guys program or something. And that person was selected based on their character. Now, why is this important? Because character is something that isn't just born. It, it has to be exemplified. There's a lot of examples in the world that I would argue are not great examples of character. And there's somewhat of an attack on traditional character. There's also an attack on traditional masculinity. And to play devil's advocate on that, there's probably some justification in that. Because masculinity isn't even across the board. There's this, this uh, I would argue that it's, it wasn't always there. In fact, the, the bully, the, the macho masculine person was not someone who was necessarily uh, uh, celebrated. But in the, you know, the mid-century after World War II, I would say that perhaps that's really when it started. When we're talking about traditional masculinity, I'm going before World War II. Now, the greatest generation did a lot of great stuff. And I can't put down the greatest generation because there is a lot of good things that came from them. But I, I would argue that in the early 20th century, when you had people like Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, who was a progressive, and Teddy Roosevelt was progressive at first, but then you know, he, he changed a little bit on his political stance. Whether you like him, these two gentlemen or not in their politics, I'm going to examine their character. Woodrow Wilson was an educator, and he tried to change education and he tried to change politics in favor of young people's education. And he, he did a lot of good things. He really did. And then let's take a look at Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was probably, uh, and I'm a little biased, but <laughs> in my opinion, Teddy Roosevelt epitomized the masculine male, the ideal masculine male image. He was an avid outdoorsman. He was a sickly child. And he overcame those obstacles by will, by sheer will. Now, he came from a wealthy family. But <laughs> because he was, came from a wealthy family, he wasn't just pampered. right? Yeah, he, he got away with some things. But he wasn't exactly pampered. He embraced the masculine form. He volunteered to go into the military because he felt like he had to prove something. He charged up San Juan Hill and he came back a hero, you know, the Rough Riders. But, he, you know, what's so great about Teddy Roosevelt, especially during the early 20th century, is he went against the grain in a lot of areas with the masculine male. Because, sure, he was... He was very physically fit when he was in the military. He gained some weight afterwards. He was adventurous. He, he, we can thank him for the National Park System and John Muir. And he was an avid hunter. He was an avid hiker. He went down to the South America to explore the Amazon, the last frontier at the time. You know? and, and he was an adventurer. But another characteristic that I admire about Teddy Roosevelt is you know when the Rough Riders came back 
You know, he, they got all this glory. They got all this glory. But he did something that not many men and military men or military officers would do at the time. He shared his glory and he was desperate to recognize those who supported him and went with him. And he gave tremendous credit to the African-American regiment that really helped pave the way for the Rough Riders to take San Juan Hill. And this is a time in early 20th century America, post-Reconstruction, that a lot of people were still not very comfortable with this idea of African-Americans uh, being equal or better than or, or whatever. He challenged the social norms. But he did it in a way that really expressed what a masculine man is. Now, how does this tie in with youth? Because Teddy Roosevelt recognized the importance of youth programs. He recognized the importance of the outdoors. And he, it, he, he not only wanted to spread the love of both, but he was an active participant in everything that he preached. The United States Congress in 1910 took the Boy Scouts of America and gave them a national charter. This is a big deal for a national uh, institution to give that kind of a high regard to a program. And this is a youth program. This was like the goal. And you now, in truth, <laughs> there's a lot of belief and there is a, an investment on the national side of it, if you will, because the Boy Scouts in the early 20th century was very much kind of like a paramilitary organization. So the Scouts were trained with all these skills that would make them excellent soldiers in the U.S. Army. They went scouting, and I don't mean just like boy scouting, I mean like they went scouting out for uh, animals and, and enemies, if you will. They would use the staffs and they had drill with the staves and the staffs. They uh, even had whistle drill, they did tracking, they uh, did the, the semaphore flags and Morse code, and all these other things, map making, all these other things, because it would set them up well to be in the military. And what's really cool, what, how this wraps around to the greatest generation, and from a historical perspective and from a teacher perspective, and this is what I always tell my students, if you ever want to see how things are going to progress or how things did progress, you add or subtract 30 years. Because it takes a generation from birth to being about 30 years old to really make an impact on society as a whole. So the Boy Scouts started in 1910. If you were born in 1910 and you're old enough to join the Boy Scouts at 13 years old, okay, so that'd be 1923, by the time that World War II came around, then you were an active scout. So our greatest generation was born and lived during one of the earliest times of not just Boy Scouting, but all those youth programs. And I want to give credit to the Girl Scouts too, because the Girl Scouts did very much the same. Now, when I was a kid in the 1990s, yeah, believe it or not, yeah, I, would, I grew up in the 1990s, my beard and everything. Teaching's a, a, a tough job. It's rough on the age. But in the 1990s, the Girl Scouts that I was around and I got to meet and got to know, the camping aspect for the most part was gone out the window. The program had changed drastically. Now, there are still some Girl Scouts who go out and actively camp. And I mean outdoors. I'm not talking about camping inside museums or inside uh, buildings. I mean like actually camping outdoors with the tents and the campfires and the whole shebang. 
But in the 1910s, 1920s, Girl Scouts did traditional camping. And of course, they, they focused on a lot more, if you will, quote unquote, feminine roles. But they were also very active in outdoor education. And that education prepared them to do what they needed to do in the 1940s. It gave them a civic responsibility. It gave them the skills that they needed at the time. It provided the leadership skills at the time. All these things, in a lot of ways, are missing from our society. And I'm not saying that our, our kids should join up a paramilitary organization. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I do believe that we need to go back to the beginning. I think we need to go back to the basics and the origins of these programs. Maybe not put such a focus on drill, right? But if we go back to the origin of these different youth organizations and we find out why they were successful and why were they booming, we can identify what is working today in society and what's not working today in society. So we need adults, we need young adults, older adults, people who know and who have the character, who are willing, if nothing else, to learn how to take young people outdoors and train them. Teach them how to properly hike. Teach them how to build a fire. Teach them tree and plant identification and animal identification. And of course, teach them leave no trace principles. All of these different things are really important in securing our natural resources. Because if we don't have people who love to spend time outdoors, then in the future, those resources aren't going to be here because people aren't going to fight for them. It's just going to seem like uh, uh, something that's extra, something that be sold off, something that can be developed. It's no big deal. No one's using it, right? So where do we start? We got this, this need. So how do we solve it? Well, the simple answer is find some type of youth organization that already exists. There's lots of them out there, including the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. Uh, there's the Baden-Powell and the Rover Scouts organization. There's, of course, 4-H. 4-H is a fantastic organization, but we can find one of these organizations that are already established. We can go through the appropriate training because youth, youth protection training is extremely important. You know, we're, we're dealing with our most precious resource, and that is our future, our children. So if you want to go through with this, and of course, if you have the background, and I don't mean the experience background, but if you have the background to pass a background check, check and get the appropriate training and follow the appropriate guidelines, then join one of those organizations. But if you have a young person in your life, maybe it's a nephew or niece, Maybe it's a cousin, or maybe it's a, a, a really good friend and he has a kid and you and your friend want to take that kid outdoors and you can be kind of like the, the big brother uncle to help them, then you can do that. But I want to, again, reiterate that safety is really important. Of course, you don't want to just start some organization yourself and not have the appropriate training, not have the uh, appropriate insurance and things like that, because things can go wrong. Kids slice their fingers all the time. Kids get burnt all the time. Their kids are kind of clumsy. You know, there's, their brains are not always fully developed to, uh, to handle <laughs> uh, dexterity exercises that, that they may need some practice in. Um, but... If this is something that you are interested in doing, then I encourage you to seek out the different groups, go through the training, and pass the background check, and, uh, and get involved one way or the other. Another thing you can do is host local meets, host local trainings and get-togethers. You can get on Facebook and you can post it in community places like, hey, I am going to have this class for young people. And of course, you want to get the insurance 100%. Now, if you are not going to have the young people doing these things, which 
you know, it can get kind of stale. You can get away with it, and kids may still be interested. But it, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a police officer or any, or an insurance person by any means. So uh, you need to research this aspect yourself. But you could host a meet and uh, have somebody sign a liability waiver. So what you teach them, they can't be held against you and things like that. That's why it's nice to have a, an organization because you already go through all that and those organizations have the insurance to cover you. But uh, you, know, you could have uh, clubs and, and meets, good friends come together and you just do it with the parents right then and there. So you could teach the parent and the parent could teach the kid, then it's on them. Um, as long as the, the parent is using their tools and the parent is using uh, <laughs> whatever it is that you are exposing them to, whether it be using a knife or starting a fire or cooking, things like that, as long as your stuff is not involved and uh, it's consensual, well then I'm sure you'd be fairly safe. Again, you wanna check into that for legal purposes. My point is, is get these young people out there and if you don't want to work with young people then work with adults if you have the knowledge and you want to make an impact on the future host an adult only group meet teach them the skills that way they can go out and uh, do the skills with their kids or uh, or something like that getting the appropriate training is really important. There's lots of great schools out there that now teach outdoor skills and you can get quote unquote certified. Of course, there's the Pathfinder School, there's Coal Cracker School, Blackie, uh, it runs a, an online program I know, Blackie Thomas, um, and there's, there's many others. Uh, out here in Ohio, we even have Waypoint Survival. So th there, there's lots of these people out there who are willing to teach the skills formally and give you a certificate or a patch or something that says that you're qualified in this particular skill. So that may be an option for you as well. So now you're probably thinking, all right, so I, I want to do this. I want to get involved. And uh, you get the training. You start in a group or you start your own group. You get your insurance, whatever it is. So you're ready to go. So now you're wondering, all right, now how do I talk to kids? How do I teach kids? I'm actually going to put together an online course this summer for this specifically with specific examples and everything to get people going. But it's not terribly complicated. Now, as a teacher, I'm trained in a very particular way, but school style education does not always line up with outdoor style education. Uh, I've been a scout leader for, oh, I think eight, eight years in my own son's programs, nine years, nine years in my own son's programs. And uh, I was even a leader after I went through the scouting program, an Eagle Scout, and I'm a professional scouter. I took the oath and everything. I was actually a district executive and a senior district executive. So I, I've got a lot of training in this. Uh, along with my formal education as a teacher. The number one thing that I can suggest in t helping you teach a young person is break things down and get down to their level. Seriously, like that is the number one thing because most of teaching is all about a relationship. Now, you may be thinking, if I'm going to run a one-day class, how am I going to get a relationship? Well, you got to break them in. you got to have like an icebreaker type activity or something. That's something that's so simple that they get success right away. Just think about you. If, as adults, we're a little bit more tolerant to failures, but young people are not. Young people need to develop that tolerance over time, and they need to experience success to kind of get them hooked, if you will, to move on and build up their tolerance when they fail. There's nothing wrong with failing. And I think that's important. That's one of the beauty, uh, beauty points of outdoor education. I think resilience 
is created and built because of outdoor education. I really do. Seeing my scouts fail in lots of different ways and they have fun doing it and they may really struggle and get irritated at the time, but then it turns around and comes back as stories. And those are the best stories and the ones that they remember. And then when they complete the challenge, when they are successful, it, they just light up and they laugh about it. And it, it's just a completely different thing than say traditional classroom. Now in the traditional classroom, when I see the light bulb go off because of critical thinking, then that's the same thing. That's success to me in that regard. But in outdoor education, it's all about them leading themselves a lot of ways to the success based off of practice time and time and time again. But you have to give them the taste of success first. So if they get excited about it and they want to know and learn the next step. And the best way to do that are baby steps. It may seem painfully slow, but that's what they need. And you need to give them the, the reward of the success as they go. And when you start seeing them falter, encourage them and cheer them on. There's lots of ways you can do that. And when it gets to the point where you see that they're getting ready to break, you need to step in and you need to support them in whatever they need so they get the success. Now, some young people will get really frustrated and rather quickly and not be willing to try. A lot of that has to do with uh, how they're raised, but also it could be because of their learning ability. Learning abilities, especially with young people, make a huge impact on their tolerance level of success and failure. So the only way to get that is you have to get to know them, which is, goes back to the relationships. You have to build a relationship. You have to know uh, what do they know and what do they not know, and are there any gaps in between? It's not just cut and dry. It's a very complicated process, but with practice, you can do it. Now, if you're a parent, you probably already know you're doing this stuff, and you just don't realize it. You know, I, I might be speaking to the choir if you're a parent here, or if you've been around kids a lot, then you already know this. But those of you who don't, who don't understand this and don't know this, then this is really important for you. If you've liked this video so far, if you found it useful, then please click like. That way other people find it and you'll be doing them a favor. We really appreciate it. So you may be wondering, okay, so I, I got this idea of how I need to start and, and get down to the level. What can I actually do? What are some examples that I can? You may be tempted to start out with knife work because that's exciting. But there is some inherent danger, obviously, with knife work. So depending on the age of the child that you're working with, which I'm gonna suggest going with the scout age of a third grader. A third grader seems to overall have the maturity, the manual dexterity to handle a knife. Now, if you have a child and you're familiar with that child's ability and their maturity, then that could be adjusted. But a good, safe age is a third grader because of their mental maturity and their physical dexterity. This is something that a lot of people may not realize, but your brain is not fully developed and your manual dexterity and everything, even though they're really good with their hand-eye coordination on a video game, their, their manual dexterity may not be where it needs to be yet. So the, the scouts, they suggest that you carve something out of soap. So you teach them the, how to handle a knife, the rules of the knife, and you carve something, anything, out of soap. Soap is soft, and you can use a butter knife if need be. That way, if something happens, they're not gonna cut their fingers off and there's not gonna be blood everywhere. It's still gonna be a struggle. It's, there's still a lot of techniques that you can teach them, like a stop cut and you can teach them how to uh, make a saddle notch or a seven notch, or you could teach them how to make curls and how to pitch the angle of the blade and seeing how that may affect it. Now, I wouldn't suggest the last one until maybe they're a little bit older and they really care 
and I want to know more about that. Because we as adults take that for granted, I think, that we're like, oh, let's get these perfect feather sticks and let's get all these nice curls and the fuzz and things like that. But a kid, a kid just wants to see the big picture and as fast as they can. So using soap to get the basic cuts in would be a great place to start. And then you give them a chunk of fat wood. Now they're not gonna make those notches and stuff in fat wood because fat wood being resinous and so hard, it's gonna be really difficult to get the results that we want. But when it comes to making the shavings, they can start a fire with, then a chunk of fat wood's a good place to start. Because using fat wood, you know it's going to light pretty easily and they get that sense of success. So then you tell them like, oh, great job. Look at what you did. This is awesome, fantastic. You celebrate it and you make sure that uh, you know, they're excited about it. And then you're like, all right, so now that you know this, are you ready for the next step? Let's make it just a little bit harder and see how they react. And you can tell based off of their facial expressions and their frustrations, if they're even ready. So even if they make a fire the first time, they may not be ready yet to grab a, a, a dry piece of wood and start making shavings and a feather stick to see if they could get that to light. They might not. But if they get frustrated quickly, then take a step back again and focus on one thing that's gonna be successful. Just one thing, and maybe that's a notch. And when they make that notch, you're like, wow, that's a fantastic notch. Let's see what we can do with this notch. And you show them how you can use it for a pot hanger. You can show them how they can use it for a, a trap. You can show them how they can use it for another tool or to join two pieces of wood together and make a piece of furniture or something like that. So you want to celebrate it and you want to show them how they can use it. And the best thing to do is show them multiple ways of how they can use it. Now, as they go on and on, set challenges and checkpoints for them saying, okay, so this is our goal. So now that you know how to start a fire with fat wood, you can get it lit with a ferro rod or flint and steel or a match or whatever it is. Now we're going to make a particular type of fire. Maybe it's a TP fire. Maybe it's a lean-to fire or a cabin fire or whatever it is. And you explain to them the purpose of those different fires. You know, a TP fire is really good for light, but it's not necessarily the most ideal for cooking. So if you're getting this ready so that you guys can have a campfire and, and roast some marshmallows and throws a, a lot of nice light, then yeah, do that and you're like, see, see how, look how bright it is around our camp. We can see our tent over there. We can see our backyard lawn furniture over there. You know, this is really nice. This is, puts off a lot of light. Now, what would we use a lot of light for? Is this really putting off a lot of heat? No, not really, right? Unless you make it really, really big. But, you know, that light could be a signal fire. So if we get lost, or if we are on a fishing trip on the shore and we want a lot of light so we can get the fish off the hook, then that's what this is good for, right? So you give them examples, you give them reasons to do it. And as time goes on and they learn all the different fires, the different techniques for whatever it is you're teaching them, take them out and ask them. So when you set up a camp, you got the tent up and everything. You go to them and say, all right, so what kind of fire are we going to make today? And have them think there's the critical thinking exercise aspect of it. And they say, well, I guess we're getting ready to eat. So if we're getting ready to eat, then I should probably make a, a cabin fire or a lean-to fire. That way I can get the coals burn up really quick so I can make something to eat really quick. Cool. That sounds good. Let's do it. Or maybe you guys already ate on your way there and you got the tents and everything set up and you're just wanting to sit back and relax and enjoy each other's company. Well, what fire are we going to use then? Well, let's, let's make a, a teepee fire. That way we got lots of light. Maybe it's cold weather and you're th they're thinking, I'm really cold. I, I need to get a lot of heat. So, well, let's make a, 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 a long fire but then we'll put up a a backboard that way it reflects the heat towards us you know like there's lots of things like this but 
the main point is you've got to do baby steps and there's going to be plenty of times that they're going to lose their patience. They're going to lose their, their train of thought and uh, fail. They're going to fail and they're going to get distracted and they're going to fail. And there's nothing wrong for them to fail. If they fail, that's okay. Again, ask them, like, all right, that's okay. That's all right. We can fix this. Well, what do you think uh, we could do better? You never ask them what they did wrong, okay? Don't, don't use that kind of language because that kind of language, especially in today's society and, and how I think society pushes us, if we did something wrong, then we're either in trouble or we failed. Now, failure has got a bad reputation. So if they're in trouble or they fail, they're going to internalize that and they may shut down on you. So let's ask them, well, what can we do better? What can we do next time to improve? How can we make this successful? And then that opens the door to them explaining it to you. Having open-ended questions works out really well. I'm a Socratic teacher. I love open-ended questions and leading students to the answer if they don't come up with it by themselves, or if they come up with it by themselves rather quickly, just to double check that they didn't just guess and get it right, I may ask them like, well, what, what made you think of that? What led you to that? That's a great idea. I'm impressed. You know, again, you celebrate it. Okay, so now we have a plan. We have a, a, the problem that we need to address, which is we, we got to get young people involved in the outdoors. That way, our, our nature is, is secure, our future is secure, but also the knowledge that we have get passed on. There's so much knowledge that is lost because uh, people didn't care to listen to their grandparents or they, they didn't bother to write it down. So passing on our knowledge, tips and tricks, and you know, that's really important. That, you know, traditions even, you know, camping traditions, that's really important. So we have a problem. How are we going to solve it? Well, we're going to get involved one way or the other. We might join a youth organization. We might reach out to you know, our own kids if we have kids, of course, or we may uh, borrow other people's kids. And there's lots of ways we can do that. You know, if we, it's our friends, let's just go out together and go camping. We'll pass it on that way. Or you uh, do an adult only club get together for a weekend and you teach the skills, one particular skill to the adults and you tell them everything I told you. That way they don't make their kid cry and frustrated and they come back to you like, it didn't work. They still don't like camping, yada, 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 right? So we wanna set up the people that we teach, we wanna see, set them up for success, right? So we, we get our group of people, we get our adults or whatever, and we have a, a lesson, just a simple lesson. And this could be a regular, get together or irregular get together, but nonetheless, we're, we're wetting the appetite, we're planting the seed so that it grows and blossoms into something more, okay? Now, once we have our people, especially kids, if we're working one-on-one -on -one with kids or if we're teaching people how to work with kids, because parents are not necessarily good teachers. That's like, I'm not necessarily a good cook. I like cooking but I may not necessarily be a good cook. I may love my children and, and want to be a great parent, but that does not mean that I am a great parent. I may not know how to teach others, right? So we all have our own gifts. We all have our own knowledge and, and styles and techniques. One way is not necessarily better than another, but we have to explicitly teach and tell people how to teach others. So if you're not working with a kid one-on-one -on -one yourself and you have this knowledge, then you need to teach. You need to pass on the skills to teach young people. So again, you tell them like, hey, you got to build a relationship if it's not your kid, right? Or if, you, if it is your kid, you don't have a good relationship. You got to have a relationship, right? You got to give them the taste of success right off the bat. Whatever it is that you're starting them out on, you want it to be so awesome and spectacular and so much fun that they want to come back for more. It's like taking a kid fishing. If you take a kid fishing and if they're not mature enough to, to learn the patience and they don't get a fish after the first, second, third time, they're going, not going to like fishing, right? But if you take them fishing and they catch a fish, 
oh man, you might have a fisherman for life, right? So we have to have the success to plant the seed. Now, once they have the success, you turn it up a notch. And if they fail, that's okay. Because then you have the success that you can fall back on. You can tell them like, hey, that's all right. You failed this time. You didn't, or you don't, you don't say fail, but we didn't succeed this time, but we learned some lessons. And remember that time where you got the fire going? Or remember that time where you made that tool with the knife, right? Like that was really cool, right? So that's okay. We're still practicing and we're going to get better. And when we get better, that means we're going to learn more. We're going to have more fun, more things we're going to do, right? So you, you got to start them off small. You got to give them the successes and you got to build up on it. And you got to break these things down systematically. You can't just tell a kid, all right, we're going to make a stop cut. If they don't know what a stop cut is, you got to use the vocabulary. So you're going to show them. Oh, yeah, let me take a step back. So there's this, this thing that works really well. It doesn't matter if you are teaching kids at school, if you're teaching your kids at home, if you are teaching your employees, if you're a manager or a business owner or something like that, it's called the EDGE method, okay? The EDGE method is perfect. It is the best method to really teach somebody a skill, okay? So the, the E stands for explain. So you're going to explain what it is. You're going to explain what you're teaching them and you're going to explain how to do it. So if you are teaching a kid how to tie a square knot, for example, you're going to say, all right, so today we're going to learn about the square knot. The square knot is used to tie two pieces of rope of the same size, the same size. And we can use this knot as a first aid knot uh, to join pieces of rope together, to extend it. Yeah, and we can use it to bind things together. But the nice thing about the square knot is it's really easy to untie. It's strong and it's easy to untie. And how you tie it is you take your pieces of rope and you are going to cross them over each other. You're going to take one end, bend it down and wrap it around the other, and it's going to make one spiral. And then you're going to take the left rope and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to take the left rope, put it over your right rope, and make the spiral again, pull it through, and there you go. So now let me show you that I've explained it. So you take the rope in your two hands and you're going to say, all right, we're going to take this rope, we're going to go right over left, make a spiral, go down and under through the hole, and then we're going to take the left rope and we're going to go over the right rope, go down, under, through the hole, make a spiral, and we're going to tie it off. We're going to pull it tight. And then just to check to make sure that we got it right, we're going to slide the two ropes together. And if the two loops are sliding back and forth together, then we have the square knot. So that is explaining, guiding, or I'm sorry, explaining, demonstrating. Guiding is where you give them the rope and you tell them how to do it. Say, all right, now take your left, put it over your right. All right, good, good job. You put it through the loop. All right, now take your left and put it over the right. Or right, right over the left, left over right. I can't remember what I said, but you know, you get the point. So you're going to walk them through it with your words. And then lastly, E, you're going to enable them. So you're going to have them demonstrate it for you. That's it. You're going to enable them. And if they were successful, then the edge method worked. But if it was unsuccessful, find out where the link is missing. You may have to demonstrate it again or guide them again and then enable them. Usually you just have to guide them through it. Sometimes you have to demonstrate it again, but usually you just have to guide them through it. All right, so the edge method, that's really important. You're going to explain to whoever you're teaching how to teach kids that. And then after you do that, you're going to show them whatever the skill is using the edge method. You're going to show them how to use the edge method by doing it. And that's pretty simple. After you do that, you send them on their way as long as you check their work and they're successful. It's pretty easy. Now that you have the plan, now you know what the problem is, what we can do to solve the problem, how to solve the problem, and you've got some ideas. I hope you can take this information and you can apply it to some young person. And if you feel like you're too old to get involved, 
I'm sure there's something you can do. You know, again, join a young person's organization. Uh, you, if you have grandchildren, of course, get them involved in that. And if you're thinking that you don't have the time to go outdoors, then do it in your backyard. But everybody's got a backyard. Just about everybody's got some grill that they can practice starting a fire on. You know, we have resources around us to help us, even if we don't have the time and we don't have the nature necessarily around us, but we have it in our hearts to do something. And you know, since COVID 2020, we have cell phones. So we could literally use our cell phones to teach somebody far away. So if you are a grandparent and you don't have young people that live near you, then set up your cell phone, do a FaceTime call with them, and just walk them through something. Maybe it's tying a knot. And you ask them, all right, now go use this knot to do something. Maybe if it's the, uh, the, the square knot, for example, have them tie two sticks together with a square knot, or have them tie their shoes using the square knot, or have them tie two rolls of blankets together with a square knot because, you know, that's a, a bedroll. You know, that's going way back in early 20th century when kids didn't have sleeping bags. They were just too expensive. They didn't have the resources to do that. So they would just grab blankets and they would roll them up, put their goods in the blankets, throw them over their shoulder, tie it at the end, and that was their backpack. So we can reintroduce these old skills from the early 20th century to to help secure our future for outdoor recreation. All right, now, if you've liked this podcast, if you've liked this video, please click like, that way other people find it. We really appreciate it. Don't forget to follow, hit the follow if you're following this podcast. That way you get all the new up-to-date stuff. This is on all major podcast networks, even on YouTube. And uh, don't forget to visit my YouTube channel, my website, www.honorableoutfitters.com and and here's an exciting thing i am starting a newsletter now the newsletter is going to be a once a month newsletter it goes out to your email the link to it is in the show notes or description below so that way you can sign up for it i'm not even asking for your name just your email and i'll send that out to you it's going to have tips and tricks it's going to have uh, up close pictures of things in my my historical collection with some small articles and things like that it's another way of trying to encourage and help people to get outdoors. Like this month's newsletter has uh, several uh, meal ideas, meal plan ideas, just to go out for the weekend. And it's talking about rucksacks and things like that. So if you're interested, don't forget to click that and you can sign up for it. And to my patrons on Patreon, thank you so much for all your support. I want to give a big shout out to Miss Klein, our newest patron on Patreon. Because without our patrons, then the podcast and channel would not happen because it costs money to get the subscriptions to run the podcast especially. But of course, it costs money for the equipment uh, to keep this going forward. And we're trying to always make it better. All the money goes right back into the show 100%. So thank you, my patrons on Patreon. If that's something you want to check out please check it out. Uh, the link, is again, is in the show notes and in the description. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.